So there's a Saturday Night Live skit, sketch comedy that I saw a couple years ago and, and I uh, took a copy of it just to use in a Bible class sometime and I never got a chance to use it. But the skit goes something like this. There's a couple of friends that are sitting down at a dinner table. They're out to eat and they're having a conversation, having a good time and one of the guests at the table said, well, um, did you hear about this thing that happened and brought up a kind of recent Me Too event uh, that took place? And there's kind of a quiet at the table and one person says, I think we should talk about it. And another person says, yes, I think we should. Are you sure? Yes, well, let's talk about it. And then there's silence. And one voice pops up from one friend saying, I think, and then a friend says, be careful, watch it. And then there's just kind of silence for the rest of the skit. And the point is very clearly made. Fear grips most of us these days. That we can't talk about just about anything, even the most important things going on, we're scared to talk about things. Whether it's things from the Me Too movement, to things dealing with race today, or to tra transgender legislation, or to politics in general, we live in a cancel culture. And because we live in a cancel culture, cancer culture, the average person is afraid to talk because at best, we think someone's gonna be offended or at worst, you're gonna be canceled. How about sharing your faith, let alone politics and other topics? Does that ever grip you with fear? Do you ever find yourself scared to just share your faith because at the end of the day, just about every teaching that Jesus spoke rubs some interest group the wrong way. Maybe, in fact, we've become so afraid, so long to talk about certain subjects that we've forgotten how pressing some of the issues are. So last week, there was a huge issue, or at least a huge part of the scriptures that had some big implications that we didn't touch on last week. There was just so much to talk about, but I think it's worth revisiting again. So if you'll recall, Elizabeth is pregnant with child and she's visiting Mary, who's also pregnant with child. And there's this interesting thing that happens as the two meet, the child within Elizabeth's womb hears the voice of Mary, knows that he's near his savior and leaps with joy within his mother's womb. The baby leaps at the sound of Mary's voice, do you realize what's happening? The baby somehow knows there's a recognition that he's near his Savior. And so note just a few of the things that kind of follow from this. What we've got here is we've got a preborn infant that has faith. Okay, a preborn infant with faith. And this is a faith that this child has no verbal way of explaining or expressing in any way, shape, or form. And further, it's an infant child with faith before this infant child has any type of Christian education or any type of exercise in dogmatics or articles of faith. And yet we've got a child that clearly has faith, saving faith in the womb of his mother. And so there's huge implications for this. On the one hand, there's implications for believing infants can have faith, right, as we hold on to. And there's implications for, of course, pro-life position, right? To be pro-life at the end of the day is not simply to keep a child if you happen to get pregnant, but to be pro-life is to speak up about it. It's to defend those children that can't defend themselves. It's to fight for good legislation. It's to protest in all the ways that God has given us the abilities to protest in the government that we find ourselves in. We call ourselves pro-life, and yet in this city of over a million people, 
There are two pro-life counseling centers, two for a city of one million people, and there's none to my knowledge anywhere near our University of Ottawa right here. So think about that for a minute. If there is a woman that is questioning whether or not she should have a child, virtually every place she will go to in this city, she will be told that it's optional. But why don't we speak up? Why don't we defend? Why don't we fight? Why don't we build counseling centers here in town? Well, for part of us, part of us somewhere in here, that sinful nature that's still in there says, this is just so much work and it puts our reputations at risk. At best, we're going to offend a lot of people and at worst, we're going to be canceled. We're going to be canceled. Well, that's just a law issue, right? And there's lots of different law issues we could talk about as well. But is it any different when it comes to sharing the gospel that you and I believe, right? We believe that there really was a Jesus that was the Son of God that entered into human history, God that did become a human being, that he lived and that he died and that he rose and that he really reigns right now and that our sins really are forgiven, that heaven exists and it is yours. Some of the most important truths, if not the most important truths in all the world. So, maybe you find yourself at times afraid to talk. Imagine then if you couldn't talk. Imagine that you went mute. And you went mute for, say, I don't know, maybe around nine months. You couldn't say anything. What would be the first thing when you got your voice back? What would be the first thing that you would talk about? What would be the most important thing to talk about? Several months after Mary met Elizabeth, Elizabeth's child was born. And Zechariah was still mute when this child was born. And the family is asking, what should we name the child? Elizabeth says, let's name it John. And they're like, really? Do you really want to name it John? What do you think, Zechariah? Zechariah writes down, his name will be John. And Luke writes, immediately his mouth was opened. What was the first thing then? The first thing that John did. He sang a song. He praised God. And this is how some of it went, some of the highlights. But it's a thick song. He begins by saying that we have already been redeemed. Past tense. He says he's been redeemed. Redeemed is one of these powerful words. It's got a wide meaning. The idea of being redeemed most widely means being liberated. That we were prisoners in some sense, but now we've been liberated. Well, in what sense? Have we been redeemed, past tense? Well, we were prisoners of sin, and we were prisoners of fear because of our sins, but somehow we were liberated by God. How? Well, the more narrow meaning of the word redeemed means to somehow purchase, right, or to buy back. Think of redeeming coupons, right? But Peter writes, it was not with silver or gold that we were redeemed, but instead we were redeemed through blood, through blood, purchased through blood. And this event will happen in the future, right? Zechariah is singing 33 years before the actual payment's going to be made on the cross, but he's saying it in past tense. Why would he be saying it in past tense? Have you ever played one of those, uh, maybe a card game or something like that, where, you know, you take your turn, and then after you take your turn, you draw a card? And then when you draw that card, it's possible that you've drawn the winning card, but you've got to wait until everyone else goes before you get to play it, but it's only a matter of time. I was playing this with our kids, right? And Soren, who's nine years old, we were playing sequence, I think, and you could tell when he draws the winning card. Do you know why? He's got a straight face, but his leg is going crazy like that as we're kind of waiting for his turn to come around. When you know you're going to win, when it is predetermined that you're going to win, but you haven't won yet, what do you act like? What do you act like? 
Is there any fear? No, instead there's nothing but this kind of joyful, pent-up anticipation because you know it's certain what's coming on down the road. In the exact same way, Zechariah has already said, I have already been redeemed. God is so 100% trustworthy. To Zechariah, it is as good as done. He's already purchased. And that means then, if we have already been purchased, we are on God's team, the creator of the universe. This story ends in victory. It is a given. So big point here, right? We have already been redeemed. We have already been purchased and owned by God. We are in his care. So, what does this lead to then? The next big point here in Zechariah's song is he says that we are then enabled, and he uses the word enabled, to serve God without fear. To serve God without fear. Enabled to do it. So when you speak, when you talk about your faith to other people, be careful, but not because you're fearing that something bad will happen to you. Be careful just simply out of respect and concern. Be sensitive. But what could happen to you? Honestly, think about that for a minute. What could happen to you? The victory is already yours. Heaven is already your destination. God is already with you, working all things out for your good. If you are already redeemed, if you are already in his care, then there is no need to fear. No harm can come that your God, the creator of this world, doesn't allow, and he allows it because in his plan, it works out for your eternal good. And Zechariah moves on, he says, so we've been redeemed, we've been enabled to serve God without fear, and so we serve him in holiness and righteousness. How's that possible? No matter how much it seems to you that when you are sharing your faith, no matter how much it seems to you that you've screwed things up by the way you've said things, or maybe how you've crafted your speech, no matter how bad you think it's gone, to God, you are holy and righteous. And he's the only audience that matters. So you're holy and righteous. And you're doing exactly then what you're called to do. So when you speak up for the unborn or for God's design of sexuality or speak up against atheistic scientific worldviews or theory as we've been talking about in Bible class, you can remember that you are already redeemed. You have been purchased and you are owned by God. You are in his care. And if you are in his care, and you are enabled, enabled to serve him without fear, okay? Because whatever he allows in his plan, he is only allowing because it is for your eternal good. And as you're carrying this out in his sight, you are holy and you are righteous and you are doing exactly what he has called you to do. And when you share the gospel, when you share your belief in the incarnation of God in human form as Jesus, when you talk about that Christmas gospel message and how Jesus really did live and die and rise for you and how he reigns and how you're forgiven and everything that goes along with that, remember, you have already been redeemed. You are purchased and you are owned by God. And so you can be enabled to serve God without fear. And whatever you say, however you share that gospel message in his sight, you are holy and righteous, and you are doing exactly what he called you to do. All right. But maybe you say, all right, all right, all right, I get it, I get it. Well, what do I say? What do I actually say? I don't know where to start. Here's where Zechariah starts, the second half of this beautiful, beautiful song that he sings. He says that we have been given the knowledge of salvation. 
And that knowledge of salvation is how we've been redeemed, right? So you start with sharing what we call basic law and gospel. The law, right? Picture yourself talking to your friend and you present God's law. I'm not perfect. And I know you're not. And there is a God that created this world and that does not like one bit the evil we bring into it. That's what we call God's law, right? The gospel. I think this time of the year, Christmas gospel. But God created us. He loves us. And so he did something about this huge problem and all the evil that we brought into this world and this evil that separates us from us. He did something about it. And it started that very first Christmas. He came to live the life that you and I couldn't, a life of holiness and righteousness. And when he died on that cross, he took our sins and he gave us his holiness and his righteousness. You know this. You know your law, and you know your gospel. So friends, brothers, sisters, just practice saying it, and then share it. Zechariah, though, he goes on. How did this knowledge come to us? Zechariah says, through the forgiveness of sins. When you learned about how Jesus died for your sins, that Holy Spirit then came into your heart, just as much as Zechariah says, into your heart. And he made his home in you. And because of that, you now know that you're saved. And you now know God's law and gospel. And in the midst, then, he moves on. In the midst of a death-filled, scary world, he ends with this powerful phrase, the last words of his songs. We have a path of peace. Zechariah's songs ends, this knowledge guides our feet into the path of peace. How? I'm not saying speaking the truth isn't tough, but when you speak it, you need to remember that you're safe. You are already redeemed. You are already bought and won and owned by God. And if all that is true, and you can remember it, and you can remind each other about it. You can step into a peace that is already yours. You can take a deep breath, a nice big belly deep breath, and you can remember that you are already redeemed. It's as good as done. So when it comes to giving, giving in to fear, you have full forgiveness. Those are exactly the sins that your God has died for you. And now, though, you have been enabled to speak without fear. So let's walk together down this path of peace. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace of God, the peace that is yours, because heaven is as good as yours, that peace that transcends all understanding may dwell richly in your hearts and in your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.